Okay, so without further ado, David Nadler has kindly agreed to give a talk in this seminar series with title uh, Lagrangian Exit Paths. And I, actually, uh, before you get going, uh, I also want to put a, a special thanks to Joey um, on MSRI's IT team for, for being willing to, to make this, uh, this happen, even though know, it, it's a holiday right now. So thanks a lot, Joey. Okay, take it away, David. Great. Okay, yeah, thank you for listening today on, on the holiday. I know my, my family is going to attempt to get outdoors later today while attempting not to be near anyone else. So I appreciate uh, everyone coming out and listening today. Um, yeah, so I, I hope we won't be interrupted. I mean, I'm at home, like I suppose many of you, uh, there's a small chance that our wireless will go out. There's also a small chance my son will start to play basketball in the room right above me. <laughs> so we'll see. Uh, I, hope, I hope we'll all, we'll all survive all interruptions. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, what I've entitled Lagrangian exit paths, and I put the, the exit in quotes, as, as we'll see why soon enough. Uh, so what I plan to do is um, remind you as a kind of first pass, I'm going to remind you of uh, what exit paths are. Many of you are experts on them. I've learned about them uh, from many of you. Uh, but in any case, I'm going to give you a kind of brief reminder on exit paths, and then I'm going to try to shift the perspective from manifold theory to symplectic geometry. And more than anything, uh, try to advertise some longstanding problems that uh, have motivated some of my own research. I'll tell you some about uh, some of my own research that have been has been motivated by these problems. But I still think there's, there's a tremendous amount that's not understood in this direction that I would love to understand. So in some sense, this is a, you know, a, a, an invitation um, for, for those who might be interested in, in thinking about these things. Okay, so let me get started and um, uh, I am working just with an iPad and will scroll, but I'd be very appreciative if anyone wants me to kind of scroll back to prior screens and so on. I'm happy to do so. Okay, so uh, we'll start with X, a manifold. Um, and associated to X is the Poincare infinity groupoid. Okay, so I'll denote this by pi, say pi X, um, which I guess you could also denote by sing of X. So this is the Poincaré uh, infinity groupoid. So what kind of object is this? So let me draw a kind of cartoon and then just remind you, I won't uh, say in detail, but just remind you what kind of beast this is. Okay, so here's my manifold X. And um, okay, so this is going to be an infinity category, but a special kind of infinite category, infinity groupoid. So all morphisms will be invertible, not just higher morphisms. And it, it, from the kind of directly from the definitions, you can say it's just the singular simplicial set of X, and you recognize that you can view that in certain models as, as an infinity category, as a quasi category. But let me just try to draw some pictures because I, I won't, uh, this talk will be more focused on the geometry and the pictures rather than the kind of homotopical organization of things. So I'm going to be a bit. Um, Lax. I don't know if that's a good, a good pun. I'm going to be a bit lax about the uh, homotopical organization and kind of more focus on the geometry. Okay, so um, let me just remind you what, uh, what this guy is. So objects, objects are just points, x and x, so here's a point. Okay, and morphisms are paths from one point to another. So one morphism, so just plain morphisms, are paths from uh, one point to another, so maybe I have uh, two points, x0 and x1, okay? And then higher morphisms are what you expect. They're triangles and higher simplices, um, so plus higher simplices, which organize, of course, all the possible compositions of paths, okay? And, um, okay, so this is a kind of way to turn your, your space into uh, kind of embed your space into category theory. Um, so one thing that's, I think, immediately helpful, and we'll get to this with exit paths in a moment, or one thing that's kind of useful about this perspective is, of course, a groupoid, uh, your spaces and groupoids are the same things, but of course, the terminology of groupoids allows us to now start to uh, think about categories, where I groupoids where morphisms are not invertible. Okay, so, um, so, 
I said, how do I remove this? Mark? I just leave it there, I guess. Um, okay, so I want to just remind you of a couple of things. So one thing just to note is that uh, if X is connected, if X is connected, then of course this Poincaré groupoid is equivalent to just the based loops, the group of based loops uh, at any point of X, okay? Um, so that's a useful, useful uh, kind of connection to classical things. Um, my motivation for thinking of this Poincaré groupoid, and as we'll see later in the talk, for thinking about exit paths and more exotic things, is that I'm interested in sheaves on manifolds. Okay, so talk a little bit at various times about applications, but in any case, I'm interested in sheaves, and in particular, when I talk about a manifold, I'm interested in local systems on the manifold. So uh, one reason that I am interested in the Poincaré groupoid is that if I so uh, if I uh, fix K, some say commutative coefficients, okay, so I won't be uh, concerned. I mean, one can go to the sphere spectrum, but one can also be very happy with the complex numbers. Uh, if I fix uh, K commutative coefficients, then I can think of local systems of K vector spaces. So I'll say K vector spaces, but of course I mean any kind of infinity version of K modules that you want to think about. So I'll think about local systems uh, I can think of them in a variety of ways, sheaves, co-sheaves, in any case, I can think of them as functors from the, say, the infinity groupoid, maybe I'll put an op here, doesn't matter, of course, it's a equivalent to its opposite, um, to uh, k-modules. Okay, so this is the infinity category of local systems, or locally constant sheaves on x, and now we've described it in terms of the Poincaré infinity group board. Oh, that's not relevant. Okay, um, okay. so that's uh, what I had planned. I sort of planned my talk in terms of slides. So that was, that's kind of slide one. So I'm gonna just sort of creep up, but please, if at any point you want me to kind of go back, let me know. Okay, so that's a kind of first starting point. And now I'd like to remind you about exit paths, okay? So now our starting point won't be uh, a manifold, but a stratified manifold. Okay, and of course, I should have said maybe that everything I've said so far has nothing to do with manifold theory. If you look at what I've written, it's all true for any topological space and, well, okay. But I guess uh, for me, the idea is that a manifold is a kind of homogeneous version of a stratified space. Okay, so let's now start with the new setup of a pair XS, which I'll call a stratified manifold. Okay, and um, what I'm going to associate to that, I'll, I'll say a bit more as we go about what I mean by that, but what I'm going to associate to that is now uh, what people call, maybe not with this notation, but in any case, I'll use it, exit XS, which is going to be the uh, uh, exit, I don't know what the right order of these words is, exit path infinity category. Okay. And, um, Okay, so I, maybe I should say I, I, the name Poincaré appeared here. There are a variety of names that it's important to mention when one starts to talk about exit paths. I originally learned about exit paths when I was a graduate student. I was a graduate student of Bob McPherson. And so I think uh, it's natural for me to list his name first. I'm sure that others have thought about this as well. But in any case, I learned about this from Bob McPherson. And David Truman, who was also a student of Bob McPherson a little bit later, uh, wrote a thesis that included some beautiful results on exit paths. And I've also learned a lot of the more sophisticated aspects of the theory from some of the people who are hosting and joining us today. So David and John and uh, Nick Rosenblum. Uh, so I strongly recommend you consult their papers for, I'll, I'll give you just a kind of uh, informal account, but of course they've, they've written very beautiful detailed papers about the subject. Okay, so, um, so let me say a word about what I mean by a stratified manifold and then just remind you of the picture of exit paths. So, um, so a stratified manifold, so what is S, this stratification? So S is going to be a collection of submanifolds. So this is gonna be a locally finite, locally finite uh, collection of submanifolds. I'll draw a picture in a moment, uh, X alpha in X. And um, maybe I'll, pause for the moment about talking about uh, any axioms that I want them to satisfy. I mean, there are different natural axiom systems that get, get you going. Um, the main thing that, um, 
we'll talk about is that you should have some kind of regularity. Okay, so that's a kind of very vague word for the moment, but I'll, I'll draw some pictures and then talk about it in the kind of next slide, so to speak, what kind of regularity I want. Okay, so let me, um, yeah, let me draw a picture now of what exit XS is before I say anything about regularity. So here's our ambient manifold X. So there's the ambient manifold X, and we're given, um, we're given a stratification. Let's see. People have very strong ideas about uh, the, what, what colors certain things should be. Anyway, um, so let's have uh, the stratification continue to have uh, kind of started with this. Uh, so it has some maybe blue points in this picture, and then maybe it has some red one manifolds and so on. Okay, so just kind of a cartoon of what a, what a stratification could look like. Okay, and now what are the, um, the objects? So once again, the objects are just going to be points of X. Okay, but now the morphisms are going to be, well, they're again going to be paths, and that's 0, 1, 2, x, but they should only exit strata. Okay, so maybe I don't know, exiting, exiting the strata. So let me draw a picture rather than try to kind of formulate this more precisely. So the picture looks like this. So perhaps I have this blue point in this blue stratum is, say, x0, okay? And then I have a red, uh, sorry, a, a blue point x1 in this stratum. Well, the, uh, these two points are related by an exit path that exits the zero-dimensional stratum and heads along this one-dimensional stratum. Maybe I'll make it, let's just keep with red, okay? So here's some gamma, okay? But it's not invertible. I'm not allowed to enter the zero-dimensional stratum from the one-dimensional stratum, okay? I am allowed to, for example, head off to a third point, x2. I'm allowed to exit the zero-dimensional stratum. I'm also allowed to exit the one-dimensional stratum. And you can imagine that this gives you some kind of higher morphism, so plus higher exit simplices. Okay, okay but the point is the... Um, the paths are no longer invertible. There's a kind of compatibility they have to have with the given stratification, okay? So I'm gonna do examples, um, but uh, I hope, I don't know, <laughs> as usual, I, I, I um, highly value seeing David and John and I guess Emily, <laughs> but uh, you know, the, it's hard to uh, know if, well, anyway, I hope you're enjoying your Memorial Day <laughs> if you're not necessarily enjoying this talk. <laughs> okay, so, um, so let me say a word about uh, about regularity, and then do some do some examples. Okay, so uh, okay, scroll up. Okay, so um, there are different so so a remark about regularity. Okay, so there are many different forms of regularity. So the one that uh, I've probably thought about the most is Whitney stratification. So Whitney proposed beautiful conditions that have the, um, uh, what does one say, the, the good quality that they're a diffeomorphism invariant. So that's, I think, the, kind of the main calling card for the Whitney conditions, but there are many, many other conditions um, that guarantee a kind of regularity. So the main kind of regularity you want is that you want um, you want uh, some uh, the idea that uh, homeomorphisms homeomorphisms of X preserving the strata S okay should act transitively on the connected components of strata okay should act uh, X transitively on connected components of uh, strata. Okay, so this is like a kind of generalization of the familiar version that if you can connect two points of a manifold with a path, then you can find a diffeomorphism of the manifold that takes one point to the other point. Okay, so this is a kind of very rough uh, idea, but let me say a kind of uh, kind of stronger version that you you would you would want which is that you want the, the structure to be uh, kind of the, the stratification structure to be uh, obtained by iteratively taking cones, okay? So you want there to be a local, locally conic, 
actually conic structure on strata. Okay, so let me, rather than trying to explain any of that, let me just draw a picture to kind of remind you of, of what this is, this is saying. So, um, so what it means is, so let me draw one of my favorite pictures, the Whitney umbrella. Okay, so here's, there's Whitney's umbrella, not a great picture anyway, but I hope you see the picture. Um, and so one would stratify this typically by saying that uh, this point is a zero dimensional stratum and then maybe there's a two, uh, maybe a one dimensional stratum here, here, and then a two dimensional stratum and then R3 is the, is the whole thing. Okay, so I can't resist shading in here a little bit. Okay, um, okay, so there's a kind of natural stratification and the, the point is that if you take a small ball around any uh, point, the, uh, the geometry of the stratification should look like a copy of RK, a copy of Euclidean space, cross the cone over some smaller dimensional version of stratification, okay? So if you take a, a small ball around here and you intersect it with the stratification, what you should see is roughly speaking, uh, okay, something, I, I hope this picture is accurate, let's see. So I drew this picture on my, my notes. Um, so you should, you should see, picture that looks like the following, kind of a figure eight. Okay. So the point is that the geometry of what I'm drawing here is completely determined by the link, what you see in the sphere, and then you've just taken a cone over it. Okay. So that's, I think, at the end of the day, that's the kind of main, um, main impact of any kind of regularity definition. And um, maybe I'll just state what the implication is for exit paths. So the kind of main implication for exit paths is the following. So, um, so if you take uh, the exit paths on the cone of say some compact stratified space, then this should be the same thing as exit paths on the link, okay? plus the adjoining of an initial object, okay. plus, oops, sorry, plus uh, an initial object. Okay. So the initial object is of course, like in this, uh, in this cartoon, the initial object is this point that we've added and it has outgoing exit paths to all the other geometry that we've had before. Okay. So I'm never sure whether I should I should uh, call this a theorem or observation. Anyway, maybe I, I am looking to John and David. I don't know if Nick is also on the screen, but I'm looking to John and David because perhaps this is a theorem of, that they've proved uh, and I don't, I don't know technically. So I'll, I'll write this as a theorem and I'll let them tell me it's not true if uh, it's not due to them, <laughs> if it's not. Okay, okay so, um, so that's exit paths. Um, so let me do uh, a couple of examples of, of exit paths, but which I think will be fun to think about uh, as we go along, okay? Maybe I'll just pause. This is already about 20, 15, 20 minutes. So I think it's useful if uh, I'm gonna pause and just uh, have a sip of water. And if anyone wants to interrupt, uh, let me just get my water. Sure, sure. quick quick question. Oh. Uh, I, this is Chris Douglas oh, from hi. across yeah, the great. street. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's fun. So by, I mean, the, the statement of what you've just written would be what, that Whitney stratifications have the feature that, or what, what, I don't know what the statement is that isn't part of the definition that you are making. Sorry, the statement of um, regularity? Well, or yeah. Or the theorem. Of, uh, okay, of the so, theorem. So, uh, so, okay, so there, yeah, there's two things going on on this slide that are uh, kind of distinct. So one is you first need to decide what is your definition of a stratified space. And so I was trying just vaguely uh, without going into details to say that there are roughly, in my mind anyway, there are two desiderata that you have. One is that homeomorphisms should act uh, transitively on connected components of strata. And the second is that your, your stratified space should have a locally conic structure at each point. Okay, so that's, that's uh, kind of by now a 50-year-old, 60-year-old 
uh, undertaking. I mean, initiated by Whitney and Zariski and others to try to understand, you know, what is uh, what is a good notion of stratification in analytic and algebraic geometry. Um, okay, so that's that. Uh, I think a lot of the ideas there are very old, and the kind of core definitions have been set up and worked with for a long time. The theorem is is distinct from that. The theorem is stating that given a stratified space, let's assume that we're working with the, one of the standard notions of stratified space. Then you can ask, given that we know that it has this locally conic structure, can I then go and calculate the exit path category on such a local cone in terms of the link? So I don't know, I hope I'm answering your question, but, but I guess I think of the theorem as a theorem about the application of the word exit, I mean the functor exit, um, whereas the comments about regularity are more about just what do I mean by stratified space. Interesting. Well, I mean, maybe this is a discussion for the tea room. I, I mean, one can, one could just in, insist that you have local conical neighborhoods, which is, of course, a feature of some definitions, and then there isn't much left to show. But I think you're thinking of something more sophisticated. Yeah, I don't know. I, I like I said, I, I, I called this a theorem and attributed it to these guys. Let's save it for the tea room discussion where these guys can defend that it is a theorem or not a theorem. <laughs> uh, I look forward to hearing. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll just, hey, this is David Ayala. I'll just pipe up. And I mean, I think that's, it's, it's once you pick a explicit description of the functor exit, then this is close to an observation, um, I'll say. It, so it's, can it's, I, it's, yeah. Can I leap in then and ask my question, which is by initial <laughs> object, you mean taking the cone? And by equal, you mean categorical equivalence? I just want to get the yeah. Theorem. Sorry, yeah. I'm being hi, Ezra. Yeah. I'm being very uh, yeah. being very uh, of course informal here. Equal yeah. means that there's an equivalence, and plus initial object means the universal construction where I uh, adjoin an initial object to the prior infinity. I see. Yeah. 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 So okay. So so uh, I'm with. I mean, I think I hope this discussion has clarified things. I mean, I guess David more or less said like if you have the definition set up correctly, then maybe this is an observation. Maybe Chris has his definition set up correctly, so he was confused that I called it a theorem. Anyway, I, I, I think once you start working with these objects, this should not be surprising, nor should uh, be difficult to, to prove with the kind of correct orientation and kind of pr probably standard tools. So, um, okay, so let me try to continue and save the further discussion. Uh, for the tea room, and hopefully I've I've not offended any uh, <laughs> I don't know any experts or novices. Okay, so um, okay, so with everyone's blessing, I'm going to continue, um, and I'm going to do a couple of examples. Um, so just exit path categories again, with the idea that uh, they'll be useful when we start talking about Lagrangian exit paths. Okay, so let me do uh, two examples that are again course, well known to experts, but I, I think, well, anyway, they're, they're still fun to contemplate. So, um, okay, so the first example is let's just take x to be the real line, and let's take the stratification, we'll draw the picture first, where we take a single point, say zero, and then we have the positive and negative uh, rays. Okay, so s is uh, zero, r less than zero, and r greater than zero. Okay, so three, three stratum space. Okay, and now the, uh, okay, so now the calculation that you should make is that the exit path category is equivalent to the following, uh, well, maybe I should say take the nerve of this anyway, or maybe it's literally just this. So I have three objects, one I will call x0, one I will call, say, x1, and one I will call x negative 1. You can think of them as being at the points 1 and negative 1. And then I have exiting paths going like this, and that's all the structure. Okay, so the exit path category in this case has three objects, single paths, and this is a, an equivalence uh, between these two infinity categories. Maybe I, I need to say something more about nerves and so on, but in any case, I hope you, you know what I mean. Okay, so this is a kind of first uh, example everyone should do, and you can see then in this case that um, to give, uh, oh, maybe I didn't, uh, I didn't say this, but I should have said this, so let me, um, let me do an act of violence on our 
Uh, so let me just add, uh, so probably, okay, if I were more adept with this, um, I could even create space. So let, let, me, let me not try to go back and edit the notes, but let me just make a remark that I should have made earlier, which is that uh, just like local systems are functors out of uh, Poincaré infinity groupoid, uh, one of the main motivations for exit paths is that constructible sheaves that are constructible with respect to the stratification are functors out of exit paths. Okay, so sorry for the, this is gonna be a moment of bad organization, but let me just uh, kind of put in a, a kind of a forgotten, forgotten remark, okay, that uh, sheaves, say of K modules on X that are constructible with respect to S, Okay, so this means that I'm looking at, as usual, in some infinity version of complexes of K modules. Um, but I require that if I restrict these complexes to any stratum, that their cohomology is locally constant along that stratum. Okay, so there are no jumps along, along the individual strata, strata. So this is uh, equivalent to functors um, from, I guess it, now I don't, maybe I didn't want the op before. Anyway, okay, from XS to K mod. Okay, so in other words, what do I need to give you? To give you a functor out of exit paths, I need to give you a stalk of your sheaf at every point. Okay, and then for every exit path, I give you a restriction map on sections and so on. Okay, so sorry I didn't, I had meant that to appear on a prior slide. Uh, so let me just box this forgotten remark. Okay. Okay, so when I go back now to this kind of uh, calculation, like exit paths here, what I immediately do to kind of uh, I don't know, assess whether I understand the situation is I think, it does this look correct from the perspective of sheaves? So if you give me a sheaf on the real line constructible with respect to the stratification, what I give you is I give you a stalk at each of these three points, and then I give you generalization maps, restriction of sections. Okay, so anyway, it's uh, compatible with this, this kind of forgotten remark. Okay, uh, yeah, so maybe I won't write more there. So let me do the second example. I realize as David predicted, I'm on uh, slide four <laughs> and it's 1030. So <laughs> um, yeah, there's a certain, there's a certain um, disconcert, I find it it's kind of disconcerting pleasure of giving a talk just like, you know, like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not in my pajamas, but I'm kind of, you know, mentally. <laughs> it's like, you know, in your house, you're relaxing. Okay, anyway. Um, all right, let me do another kind of another example. Let's take X equal to C. Of course, the idea that it's the complex numbers is immaterial for our discussions. We're doing topology, but uh, you can think of it as R2 if you like. And then let's take the stratification by zero and the complement. Okay, so here's my stratified space. Okay. And now let me just remind you of the calculation of exit in this, in this situation. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, okay, so, um, so always when I'm doing these calculations, I'm trying to present a kind of smallest model of the category, so I have the kind of most uh, kind of concrete understanding of it. So of course, nothing I'm going to say can beat the definition, so to speak. So the definition is a beautiful and variant definition that I'm not trying to upstage, but to kind of really see what it means, for example, to give a sheaf, it's useful to give a kind of more, uh, kind of a smaller model. So in this case, I have, um, I have two favorite points. I have x0, um, or maybe let's, let's uh, do that. Oh, I'm playing with a new, uh, new pad. Okay, so let's do, X zero, oh, it didn't go blue. X zero, okay. And then uh, we'll also take a point I'll call X one, which is a generic point, it could have been any other point. Okay, and I clearly have now an exit path, uh, what did I call it, R for say restriction of sections going from here to here, okay. So what it starts to look like is that I have an object x0, uh, a point, another object x1, a restriction map, I should have given myself more room, r. But now I also have uh, another beautiful morphism. I have this looping morphism that I'll call m for monodromy that goes around, okay? So I have this other morphism 
that goes around called M, okay? And then I finally can see in the picture that there should be some kind of a two simplex relating these two. So in fact, what I have, which I'll, I'll try to just kind of draw on the side here, is a two simplex that looks like the following. So if I do, um, if I go from x0 to x1, and then go to x1 again by the monodromy, that that is the same, so to speak, as just going directly to x1. And this is this green filler. Okay, so this green kind of fills in here. Okay, so it kind of, uh, from the perspective of ordinary category theory, you have, uh, you know, an amorphism R, uh, amorphism M, which is invertible. Maybe I, I need to say, I haven't thought about whether I, I need to specify that. I probably should specify that again. And then I have this relation. Okay. So anyway, this is a kind of informal, I, I hope you know what I mean when I draw this kind of picture. It's kind of a smaller version of the full definition here. Okay. So to give a sheaf here, I need to give you uh, I need to give you a, a stock at zero, a stock at one, a restriction map, a monodromy, an invertible monodromy, and then they, those maps have to satisfy a relation coming from this two simplex. Okay, maybe I should write M and Okay. Okay, so this was now the conclusion of the kind of, maybe, maybe I am on target, I know this is the conclusion of the background material. Okay, so I, I hope I've reminded and not completely bored you with the notion of exit paths and uh, sheaves uh, in terms of exit paths. And now what I want to do is I want to kind of shift our viewpoint. I want to move from manifold theory or stratified manifold theory to symplectic geometry and Lagrangians and symplectic geometry. Okay, so, um, okay, so I didn't think it doesn't hurt for me to just pause here and see if anyone wants to ask another question or comment. It's kind of natural moment of uh, before this stuff kind of disappears forevermore. You know, there's some some rule when you teach uh, calculus, uh, you're supposed to wait and make the audience as uncomfortable as possible until some poor soul will will ask a question just because they can't suffer anymore. But I'm not sure it works online. Everyone is just happy to you know, <laughs> happy to tune out. Um, okay, so I will continue, but please, please, please interrupt. Uh, I'm happy to happy to be interrupted. Okay, so um, okay, so now I want to uh, kind of uh, shift shift viewpoint, and I'll say a word or two, kind of in a philosophical vein, and then it'll quickly become kind of uh, more concrete. Okay, so I want to start, we've been playing with what I would call, I don't know, smooth topology. Okay, in particular, we've been starting with X a manifold. And I wanna remind you that smooth topology can be thought of as a part of symplectic geometry. Okay, it's not clear the exact relationship, that's still a, a beautiful wide open subject, but there's definitely a way to go from smooth topology to symplectic topology. And that is by taking a manifold and assigning its cotangent bundle. So if I say M equals T star X, it's cotangent bundle. Okay. And let me say just a word about how I'm thinking about the cotangent bundle. As a manifold, I was thinking of it as a smooth manifold. When I think of the cotangent bundle, I'm thinking of it as a symplectic manifold. One can even say it's a special kind of symplectic manifold called an exact symplectic manifold. Okay. So I won't get bogged down in details, but let me just remind you that there's an, a, there's a symplectic form here. So if you have local momentum and position coordinates, so if I locally, just, ah. <laughs> okay, HT, okay, that'll just be part of the talk. Let's see if I can erase it. Okay. Um, okay, so if I have, um, Oops. Sorry. Okay. So, um, so locally, if I have uh, Q is forever more, will I have this line here? Um,
see. Okay, so if Q, <laughs> of course I'm welcome to tech advice, <laughs> I don't know, iPad advice, is such a thing, do I, I don't know, how do I get rid of this line? Okay, maybe I just try to write below this line. Let's see. Okay, so if Q, if Q is a position, so these are local coordinates on the manifold, and P is dual momenta, so momentum coordinates, then the symplectic form in sort of one convention is dP dQ, okay, which is uh, the differential of a form P dQ. Okay, so the point is that this kind of a structure where you have a symplectic form, which is the differential of a one form, so this is symplectic, and this is a primitive, a primitive for the symplectic form, this kind of situation is called an exact, an exact symplectic setup or manifold. Okay, um, and I want to just remind you that uh, given this setup, we, sorry, I think it's when I rub my hand on the bottom of the screen. Okay. So given this setup, if I, uh, I can, I always associate to it a, a vector field called the Liouville vector field, which is just what I get when I apply the symplectic form, well, the inverse of the symplectic form to the, uh, to the one form, I get a vector field. Okay. And in the case of a cotangent bundle, this vector field is just, um, uh, what is it, uh, P, D, P, okay? So it's just the usual dilation vector field, up to, up to sign. I haven't been, been careful about sign. Okay, so, um, so I want to shift perspective. I want to take all of the things we've been discussing that we've thought of as being associated to smooth manifolds and stratifications of smooth manifolds and think of them as being associated to rather to cotangent bundles, okay? And I want to, as a kind of first orientate, orienting uh, comment, uh, I want to just uh, remind you of a kind of piece of philosophy, which is the following. So the basic important uh, idea when you start to study, say, manifolds is, is maybe due to the, the kind of first axiom of geometry. I don't know, or first, it's not an axiom, it's a, I don't remember what they're called, first notion of geometry, which is that uh, a point, uh, okay, so what is a point? It is that which has no part. Okay, so you're not going to get any smaller than a point. So when we define a manifold, we start by saying it has points, and we don't have to talk about it half points or protons and neutrons, I don't know, it has, it has points and that's, that's the beginning. But in symplectic geometry, there's a slightly different point of view that I think is important to emphasize. So symplectic geometry does start with manifolds and symplectic forms on those manifolds. But in some sense, that's the wrong starting point. That's a kind of misleading starting point. And the Heisenberg uncertainty principle kind of gives you a better idea of what the starting points should be. The starting point should be Lagrangian submanifolds. Okay, so I'll just para, you know, sort of be silly here and say a Lagrangian uh, L in X is, is that which has no part. Okay, so we're really not allowed to talk about points or lines. We're only allowed to talk about things that are at most Lagrangian, or at least Lagrangian, I should say. So we're allowed to constrain, say, half of the momentum. So let me draw a kind of cartoon of the picture. So here is uh, X, and here is its cotangent bundle tangent bundle of X. And the kind of thing that we're allowed to draw in manifold theory are like, you know, it's like a point. Okay, so here's the point X that I've been drawing. But in symplectic geometry, we're not allowed to just pick a point. We're only allowed to constrain half the coordinates. Okay, so I can draw something like this. If that's a very nice Lagrangian. Or I could draw something, I don't know, here's another L prime, draw more points, X primes, and so on. Okay, so these half dimensional pieces are really the basic building blocks. And any theory should kind of always have in mind that they are uh, the minimal 
geometry in the subject. Okay? So one of the things that makes symplectic geometry so wildly interesting is you can see from this picture, if I have an x and an x prime, they don't intersect. Or I should say they intersect if and only if they're equal. Okay? But two Lagrangians can be very far from equal but still intersect. Okay? So much of symplectic geometry is devoted to understanding the ways in which the points of symplectic geometry, i.e. the Lagrangians, intersect. Okay? And that's going to be important as we, as we go over. Okay. Okay, so I've shifted viewpoints. All right, so that was just five minutes of philosophy. I've shifted viewpoints from smooth manifolds to cotangent bundles. Now I want to go back and think about what is the notion of a stratification in this new context. Okay, so let me scroll up and tell you what I'm going to take as the notion of uh, stratification. Okay, so what is uh, the analog or what is what? What, uh, what plays the role, what plays the role of the stratification S, okay? And people could give you different answers to this. So I'm gonna propose an answer just for this talk, a kind of standard answer that I think is the relevant one for this talk, but I don't by any means say that, that it should be universal. Okay, so what plays, uh, what plays the role of stratification. Okay, so to any stratification, S X alpha, alpha, uh, some index set A, okay, so remember what is this? These are some manifolds. I can associate to this a beautiful object that I'll denote lambda S, so it's going to be the union of the conormal bundles to these submanifolds. Okay, so X alpha X, so this is the union of the conormals Okay, and just from the start, we can discuss what kinds of, what kind of an object is, is this? So the basic properties that this object enjoys, which are first important to kind of just recognize right from the start. So the first property is that it's a closed uh, sub-variety. I'll call it a sub-variety. I'm not necessarily assuming any algebraic geometry or analytic geometry, but it's certainly not a manifold. I mean, a sub-manifold. So I need some words, so it's a subset. But it's typically much, much better than just a subset. So I'm going to call it a subvariety. And one thing that I'm going to emphasize is that it's closed. And let me say that this is not trivial. This is a consequence of you having some kind of regularity. Okay. okay. The second thing that's very, very important to recognize is that it's conic. Okay. So this means conic for this vector field is Z. Okay. Z, I guess in this case, is P, D, P. Okay, so if a covector is uh, in the conormal, any scale of that covector is still in the conormal. I mean, any uh, say positive real scale. In fact, negative real scale as well. And the third property, which is maybe the kind of most important, is that it's Lagrangian. Okay, so what do I mean by that? So I mean that this, I mean, this lambda s is, of course, a union of conormals, and each of those conormals is Lagrangian. Okay, so it's cut out by a uh, kind of uh, conserved system of, of, uh, of quantities. Okay. So this is not a submanifold. It's a kind of very singular space. I'll draw some examples. Um, but uh, so the proposal that I'm making, it just a standard proposal on the subject, is that whatever your stratification was, let's pass to this lambda s, which is a closed conic Lagrangian. Okay. And so now we can have a kind of, I'll do it in red, a kind of a new starting point. I'm going to do some examples in a minute, so it's not so abstract, but a kind of new starting point. So new starting point. I'm going to put it here. Okay. So the new starting point is that M is, can be, say, uh, an exact symplectic, symplectic, manifold, okay? And I think I won't, yeah, maybe I'll say a word or two about what, uh, what, I, what kinds of exact symplectic manifolds are kind of typically you encounter and are most reasonable to study, but let me just, for the moment, let me just say that that's a kind of ab abstract version of what, what structures a cotangent bundle has. Okay, uh, so this, is, this is Ezra. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, when you say exact, do you mean you're selecting a particular one form? Yes. 
so we can talk more. I mean, one of the important things is later we may want to show invariance under, say, homotopies of that one form. But for the moment, let's have in mind that we've truly fixed an exact structure. So in fact, at the end of the day, one of the most, maybe I'll just skip to one of the punchlines, is that one of the most important things, reasons to do this story, is there are many, many symmetries of, say, categories of sheaves that do not preserve the stratification, so to speak. Like you do wild things that don't preserve the stratification, but do preserve the symplectic geometry or like kind of come from symplectic geometry. So, and those typically don't preserve the exact symplectic structure. So I know I haven't explained anything in the last two sentences I just said, but just to answer the question, Ezra, and to kind of motivate for those who are kind of thinking ahead, one of the main reasons that I want to do this passage from usual manifold theory to symplectic geometry is there are a lot of symmetries and beautiful alternative descriptions of the same categories, kind of dualities, that you only see once you've kind of passed to this, this symplectic point of view. Okay, so Ezra, hey, thanks. No, Thank you. Meant. Yeah, so, but for the moment, let's fix, so M is exact symplectic, so maybe I'll write M lambda just to emphasize that I have this one form whose differential is a symplectic form, okay? And, <clears throat> excuse me, and inside of M lambda, I have some uh, closed conic uh, Lagrangian, okay? And, you know, the example that I've suggested we, that led us here is M equals T star X and lambda equals some lambda S for some stratification. Okay. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> Okay, so in the name of time, I think I'm going to skip some material I was going to talk about. Uh, so what I'm going to do in the name of, of time is I'm going to, there, there's kind of two new variables here. There's the symplectic manifold, and then there's these kind of Lagrangians that we're, we're equipping the symplectic, we're placing in the symplectic manifold. In the name of time, so I'm going to, for, for this talk, I am going to fix the symplectic manifold always to be a cotangent bundle, okay? So, so I'm gonna skip, so let me just uh, make sure this will make sense. I think this will make sense. So um, in the name of time, let's, uh, let's assume M is going to be a cotangent bundle. Okay, so I want to advocate to you that you think beyond just M being cotangent bundles. I had several slides that are very, very beautiful, uh, you know, maybe I should say like uh, all um, Stein manifolds are examples of these exact symplectic manifolds. There's a huge world of algebraic geometry out there that I advocate you eventually get to, but in the name of time, let's assume M equals T star X. And so from our perspective now of starting with exit paths and stratifications, the main new variable is that we're allowing ourselves lambda that are not necessarily unions of conormals to a stratification. Okay, so the, the main variable, main variable is lambda. Okay, so, um, so again, a closed conic Lagrangian. So let me, um, let me do several examples of this to show you that they're kind of, well, kind of demonstrate that there are examples out there that are not just conormals to stratifications that are important to understand, okay? Okay, so let me, first example. So I'll draw a picture and then kind of say that the, I'll draw a picture of a very small example and then suggest where in mathematics that example lives, okay? So let's take M, to be say T star of the circle, just for concreteness. So here's a picture of the tangent bundle to the circle, okay? And now let's take lambda, maybe I should start to develop some, some color scheme. Oh, let me make it not in the in the time. So let's take lambda to be the zero section, union, uh, some spikes. Okay, so, Here's the zero section, okay? And now I'll allow myself to take some spikes. I insist that everything be closed, conic, and Lagrangian, so that more or less restricts me to just adding some spikes. Like that's about all there is that I can do here. I can also have some spikes going down and so on, okay? So that's a picture, picture of lambda, okay? So the thing I wanna emphasize from the start is that my spikes didn't necessarily go up and down, okay? If I were taking conormals to a stratification of the circle, at each point I would have a spike going up and a spike going down. 
And indeed, there'd be no more or less more information to the Lagrangian than there is to the points where those spikes were based. But here I'm really kind of on beyond just taking conormals to a stratification. Okay. So let me just suggest, uh, I said, so there's one example of the kind of thing you can have in mind. And let me just say that uh, more generally, uh, just to kind of send you in some interesting direction if you're curious, so more generally, if you take M to be cotangent bundle to uh, say S1 to the N, okay, then there are beautiful uh, Lagrangians that will allow you to do mirror symmetry and understand coherent sheaves on toric varieties. Okay, so more generally for M equals, uh, there are lambda that are dual to toric compactifications. of C star. Okay, so this is just a kind of uh, advertisement if you're interested in mirror symmetry, studying these lambdas is very, very important. Um, and they are definitely not conormals to stratifications. They're much, much more interesting. They, in fibers, they have various sectors and all sorts of interesting structure. Okay, so this is one example that I hope you can both see pictorially and you can go and uh, kind of look for further research in this direction. Okay, the second example that I want to mention, uh, it's a little harder to draw, is I want to think of M as being the cotangent bundle of say the adjoint quotient of a complex Lie group. Okay, so G is a complex, say semi-simple Lie group. And I'm not gonna spend any time talking about what I mean by the cotangent bundle of the adjoint quotient, except to say that you take the cotangent bundle of G and you do Hamiltonian reduction and you get something and well, anyway, it's a kind of, you can understand it completely from the cotangent bundle of G via dis descent. So for now, this is just a kind of a, kind of a placeholder, but I want to mention a very important example uh, here, which is that this cotangent bundle has a moment map to the dual of the Lie algebra of G, and you can study lambda, the lambda uh, can be the nilpotent cone, nilpotent cone, um, inside here. So these are uh, nilpotent cone of nilpotent co-directions. Okay, so I'm not going to explain this except to just advertise that again, this is an example of something that's very, very far from being conormals to a stratification. Okay, so for example, if you look at the identity of the group and you ask what co-vectors are, are, are uh, in my lambda, it'll just be the nilpotent cone. It'll just be the cone of matrices that are nilpotent, which is very, very far from a linear subspace. Okay. okay, and let me just advertise also, I'm kind of kind of trying to go a little quickly here just to kind of get somewhere, but let me say more generally, more generally that M, whoops, doing that, uh, M uh, equals the cotangent bundle to bun G of a Riemann surface, which is what people call the Hitchin moduli. Uh, has a nilpotent cone uh, similarly. Okay, so this is a baby example of a huge subject in gauge theory, which is to understand the geometry of the, the special fiber of the Hitchin system. Okay, so anyway, that was kind of maybe too fast to be comprehensible, but at least it gave you some kind of table of contents of where, of why you might care to generalize your, your Lagrangian. Okay, so now I want to get back to kind of more concrete things, kind of get back to exit paths. So I want to now ask, what, what, so what is the question? <laughs> okay, so I've introduced this generalization and now the, kind of get back to reality. So what is the question? Okay, so given, say, um, uh, M, equals T star X and Lambda, some closed conic Lagrangian, okay? I would like, and, and I, when I say I would like, I don't mean like I would like, and then I'm gonna tell you a theorem. I mean, I would like someone from the audience to invent this, <laughs> this subject. I would like an analog of exit pads in this context. And I'm gonna tell you some things, I mean, I've thought about this for a long time, so I don't think it's a, kind of such an easy question. 
But uh, so I'm gonna tell you some progress towards this question, but I want to really advertise that I think this is a beautiful question to, uh, to think about. Um, so I want, so, well, okay, so let me say, uh, we have the category of sheaves, uh, sheaves of K modules on M with singular support in lambda. Okay, so I'll explain what this is in a moment. We have, this is sheaves on M with singular support. I'll remind you of what this is in a moment, singular support on or in lambda. And we want, so a uh, challenge, define some kind of, uh, I don't know, I don't want to call it exit because well, I'll call it exit in quotes, exit of, uh, you know, M lambda, okay? So that this sheaves M lambda, this functors from this exit M lambda to modules over K. Okay, so it's some kind of topologist's version of, well, it's, it's okay, of sheaves, I don't know, it's a kind of object of topology, okay? And sheaves with singular support in lambda should be its modules, okay? And it should have all the, I mean, I can list some formal properties, but I hope just for now this will be kind of sufficient to say it informally. So let me remind you what um, are, let me remind you of what is singular support, and then we'll do some examples. Okay, maybe I should pause for a question. I feel like things have gotten a little scattered because I skipped a lot of what I was going to say, but um, I hope I hope people are still following. Okay, so um, maybe I just, in case someone's going to ask a question, I'll just. Our interest is, is peaked. <laughs> What's that? Our interest is peaked. Oh, okay. Well, so I was going to say, of course, of course, this exit path. Well, okay. Let, right, let me let me just uh, continue. Okay. So 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 what is singular support? Okay. So singular support. Okay. Um, and this is following uh, Kashiwara Shapira. So, their book Sheaves on Manifolds contains this, this notion, and it's a very important notion. Um, okay, so what is singular support? So let me just try to explain it to you informally, okay? So let's say I have, uh, as usual, X a manifold, and to make my life simple, I'll assume I have a stratification, so S equals some X alpha uh, stratification, okay? So I'm going to associate to any F uh, inside of sheaves that are constructible on the stratification, I'm going to associate to this uh, its singular support, okay, which is going to be inside of the cotangent bundle of X, and it's going to be a closed conic Lagrangian subset. Okay, so to every sheaf F, it has not just a support inside of X itself, but it also has a notion of support in the cotangent bundle. Okay, this is a kind of singular support. Okay, so, um, so let me draw a picture to try to convey what's going on. Okay, so I have my uh, manifold X and then I have uh, stratification. Okay, and I have some sheaf. Okay, and now I'm gonna ask when is a covector uh, X comma C in the singular support? Or really, it's usually easier to say when is it not. Okay, so I start. I start with some uh, x c inside the tangent bundle. Okay, so maybe here's x and here's c. Okay, so I'll draw covectors like vectors. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I want to ask: Does the sheaf behave like a local system in this direction, or really this co-direction? If the sheaf behaves like a local system in this co-direction, then this will not be in the singular support. Okay, so let me write some, some of what I just said. So uh, X, C, um, so X, C is not 
in the singular support of F, okay? If the following happens. So what I do is I will look at a small ball around X. Here's a small ball, okay? And I will choose a function that vanishes at X. Um, so let me just write, so B, so I'll choose a function on this small ball, okay, to the reals, okay? And I'll require that F of X is zero and DF at X is C. So I've picked a function that vanishes at a point and has Xi as its first derivative, okay? And now I'm going to ask, do the vanishing cycles for this function vanish? <laughs> okay, so there's too many vanishes, but anyway, I'm gonna ask whether the vanishing cycles for this function vanish. So what I'm going to do is I'm going, I'll, I'll write more, but I'm going to look at the vanishing cycles for this function, okay, at this point, x, okay, of f, and ask if this is zero. Okay. okay, so let me remind you what this vanishing cycles is. So IE, what this means is I look at sections of F on, uh, oops, sorry, sections of F on the ball. Okay, and I look at a restriction to sections on the subset of the ball where F is say less than zero, okay? By so there are different conventions, greater than zero, less than zero anyway. And I ask that this is a you know, isomorphism, quasi-isomorphism, okay? So the vanishing cycles measures the difference between these two. So what you're measuring is you're asking on the one hand, what are my sections on the whole ball? On the other hand, what were they in the past? So I like to think that there's like, you know, there's present life and then the past, and you ask, was there no change from the past to the present? And if there's no change, then C is not in the singular support. Okay. So the singular support is then the closure of things that don't satisfy this. I mean, this, the singular support is a closed subset, so I just will take closure of things that don't, don't satisfy this. Okay, so it's not in the singular support if the vanishing cycles vanish. Okay, so let's do an example. Um, so let's see, yeah, uh, let's do a kind of as concrete an example as possible to see what this, this gives us and how, it, how it's an interesting notion. Okay, so I have to scroll up a bit. Um, so I hope I don't, please stop me if you'd like me to return to. Okay, so let's do an example. So the, let's do the easiest possible example. So let's take X to be the real line, okay? And let's look at, so I'm gonna draw now the cotangent bundle. So here's the cotangent bundle. So here's the zero section, okay? And now I'm gonna look at my lambda. Uh, lambda is going to be the zero section, T star XX, so that's the zero section, union the positive conormal to zero. Okay, so if I draw my lambda in red, it's this. Okay, so this is lambda. Okay, and now I can ask what sheaves have singular support in this, uh, in this red locus. Okay, now of course I uh, am yeah, I'm going to restrict to sheaves that are constructible on the given stratification, okay? So let's go back and remind ourselves that sheaves, in this case, sheaves on this given stratification look like modules over this uh, diagram, x1, x minus one, okay? But now I can ask, what is the condition that the singular support is, say, not in here? Okay. And I can't figure it out in real time, and I think I've already kind of <laughs> left my notes too far behind to make sense of it, but that condition will mean that one of these uh, globalization maps is actually an equivalence. Okay, so remember, this is the stock at x0. This is the stock at, at 
uh, positive. And so if I want to, yeah, so I think it means, so let me just write it like this, sheaves x lambda will be modules over this same diagram, zero, one, but I require this to be an isomorphism. Okay, so it's a bad notation. So write it as modules over, but I hope you know what I mean, okay? So it's a full subcategory, okay, of this category of sheaves, but I've imposed an equation or really localized. I've told you that I need this arrow to in fact be invertible. Okay, so this is, this um, isomorphism is imposed by the fact that zero comma negative dx is not in allowed in to be, it's not like this, um, is may not be in the singular support. Okay, since it's not in lambda. Okay. So, okay, so that was a kind of whirlwind reminder of the notion of, of singular support. Okay, with an example. So to every uh, sheaf, I can assign it singular support. And so given a lambda, I can ask to only study those sheaves with singular support in the lambda, and in the given lambda, and I can try then to invent a notion of exit paths that's uh, kind of built for that lambda. Okay. Hey David, this is David yeah. Ayala. Yeah. Do you expect or hypothesize that the quote exit in the case where lambda is lambda sub s, you know, mm -hmm. will always be a localization of exit for s? So in the case where, uh, sorry, maybe I should have said, in the case where lambda is lambda s, these yeah. are normals, there's two things. Oh, that they, I'm sorry, I missed but, but go, what you're going to say. Meant a subset, of, a yeah. subset of lambda sub s is probably what you. Yeah, mean. that's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so David asks that. So, so okay. So, so, um, so let me just make a remark. Okay. So if lambda uh, is a subset of some lambda s or some some s, okay. So if then sheaves with singular support uh, inside uh, lambda is a full subcategory of sheaves uh, lambda s, which is just sheaves s. Okay, so this is our old friend. And now we're saying there's some uh, full subcategory. So here it was the full subcategory where the, the uh, sorry, I'm pointing with my uh, <laughs> pen, but in the slide above, it was the full subcategory where that was an isomorphism, that globalization map was an isomorphism, okay? And probably for formal reasons, that means that the exits should be a local, like you can invent a localization, as you say, you can say certain exit paths should be invertible. Let me say from the start that that's not the solution I want. And the reason I don't want that solution is because that solution continues to give precedent to X rather than take in all symplectic symmetries. So let me describe exit paths in the case, in the example we've just, let me describe a solution in the case we've just, we've been discussing and just say to you that I think you're right, that it will be a localization, but that's not the solution that I want because it's kind of not manifestly invariant under some symmetries, which we'll see in this example. Great, that's helpful, thanks. Yeah. Okay, it's great, thank you. Yeah, it's very, very, uh, um, Good, good remark. Okay, so let, let me, uh, so let me ask, so what, so I'm going back up to this example. So what is exit uh, uh, T star uh, X lambda in above, above example? Okay, so let me redraw the, the picture. So we have Kind of a cotangent bundle, and then we had this um, we had this Lagrangian lambda. Okay, and <clears throat> if you go back 
to our, um, we, I mean, you see it up here on the top of the screen. We have, we have a description of sheaves as modules over some kind of exit paths. You have three points, x0, x minus one, and x1, but x1 and x0 are now equivalent. Okay, so we have a kind of naive, this is kind of what David suggested, naive solution that we have a point called x minus one, a point called say x0, which is the same as x1, and then we have an arrow. Okay. okay, and that's correct in the sense that modules over this uh, quiver is in fact the correct category of sheaves. Okay. But it's what is unpleasant about this or what I don't like about this is, well, it's very ungeometric. I mean, somehow it's hard to imagine sort of how it generalizes in, 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 in more complicated situations. And it also misses some symmetries. So let me at least focus on the symmetries, which, um, so, so, but this is, uh, misses beautiful symmetries. So let me point out that anytime you have this arrow, so let me say, this is say x0 equals x1, this is x minus one. Anytime I have this arrow, I can always take the cone of a module. And so what I could have done is I could have decided that I didn't just have one arrow, I had a kind of distinguished triangle. Okay, so I don't know how one denotes this, but a triangle here, okay? But Mrs. Beautiful Symmetries of triangles. Okay, so here when I draw this picture, giving a module over this triangle is the same thing as giving a module over this arrow. Anytime I say a module in a stable target, anytime I give you an arrow, I can take the cone and extend it to a triangle. And anytime I have a triangle, I can restrict it to this initial arrow. Okay, so these two are, are equivalent descriptions of the same stable category. I mean, they're, they're kind of once I stabilize, they're they're the same. Okay, but this one has a beautiful trivalent symmetry. I mean, the triangle has a beautiful trivalent symmetry, which in fact the symplectic geometry has. Okay, so it's not completely clear, but this picture from the perspective of symplectic geometry, this picture is equivalent to, to this. What's the sorry, it's into This was supposed to look beautifully symmetric, <laughs> okay? So the idea is that if you, in symplectic geometry, this picture has a beautiful rotational symmetry, okay, preserves the symplectic geometry. This picture, it's not so apparent, but it is true that the category of sheaves has this trivalent symmetry, okay? But from the perspective of exit paths, you're completely missing, I mean, traditional exit paths, from this, from the perspective of, uh, say, this description, it completely misses this beautiful symmetry, okay? Whereas this description, well, it's more complicated, but it clearly sees this, this rotational symmetry. Okay. So I haven't tried to formulate precisely what I want from quote exit paths. I mean, I can formulate some precise statements, for anyone who wants to think about it, one thing I want is that it should really be an invariant of the symplectic geometry, not just an invariant of the so-called polarized symplectic geometry. It should be agnostic to the fact that you're in a cotangent bundle and you had a zero section. Okay, okay so I don't know what the eventual answer will be, but I think that this triangle is probably as good as it gets in this example. Okay, so in some sense, one case where I can tell you what is quote exit, it's this triangle uh, for this for this setup. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm running short on time, and I know as an audience member, it's always best to just be kind of treated gently and then let go early, as opposed to <laughs> have things crammed down your throat. 
So let me, let me say a kind of just a kind of word of philosophy about this example and then, and then quit. Okay, so there's, there's an, maybe it's not philosophy. Okay, so this example, this, uh, so let me just say that this is um, a possible good solution for exit in this case. Okay. So let me say what of this picture we know how to generalize. There's a very easy part of this picture that we can just say in general. So I can tell you what the points are, what the objects are of quote exit, and then the real challenge is telling you what the morphisms are. Okay, so to finish, so just in the next five, 10 minutes, I'm gonna to try to tell you what the object should be of quote exit in general, um, and then it will be an open problem for you to figure out what the, what the morphisms are. Okay. Okay, so objects of quote exit, uh, say what is it, T star X lambda in general. Okay, so I unfortunately I can't draw so many more pictures, so I'm going to draw the same picture, <laughs> which maybe is pedagogically helpful, but in any case, I have in mind now that we're talking in general. Okay, so, so here's the picture, it's a kind of a cartoon now. Okay, and here's my lambda. Okay, and now what I want to do is I want to think about the role of points in any exit path category. So the role of points is that they're there so that I can take the stalks of sheep. I mean, somehow that's if you take the point of view that what you may want to apply this to are sheaves, um, then of course the role of points is that they're they're what they're the kind of most basic functionals that you can apply to sheaves. So what's interesting when you start to think in this symplectic point of view is that points are no longer the most basic functionals. Okay, so the most basic functionals now are not stalks, but vanishing cycles. Okay, so I'm gonna to try to explain. So the basic functionals, functionals on sheaves x lambda are vanishing cycles. what I was denoting like phi f x, not uh, stalks. Okay, so let me demonstrate it in this picture what I mean, okay? So anytime you have a point, let, let's make the points blue, point of x, so here's a point x and x, okay? You can imagine doing just what we did before with singular support, I can take a small ball around it, I'm going to take a small ball, so ball around it, okay? And then I can take a germ of a function, a function defined on this small ball that vanishes at x, okay? Now, to draw that function, I'm going to draw it symplectically by drawing the graph of its differential, okay? So let me use a new color just to highlight the importance of this. So let's uh, draw it in, say, green. So given a function, okay, I'm drawing the graph of the differential of f. Okay. So anytime I give you a point and a function on a small ball, I can do this construction and I get a tiny little Lagrangian graph. Okay, so for example, I could have gone here and taken a little, taken the zero point, a small ball, and then taken the graph of a, differ of a differential of a function and gotten something like this. Okay, here's another example. Okay. okay, so there are two things that I want to kind of convey with this picture. So one is that this data that I've just chosen, so I have x and x, small ball, b, so small ball around x, and then f from the ball, through R, say with f of x equals zero, um, this data allows me to define vanishing cycles. Okay, so to this data, I can define uh, vanishing cycles, B f x, which is a functor from sheaves, say x, say on my stratification, to modules. Okay, just like we had before in the notion, 
had before in the notion of singular support. Okay. And on the other hand, I hope what's apparent from the picture is that some of these measurements are nicer than others, namely when the graph of the differential of the function is transverse to lambda. Okay, so let me emphasize this is nicest when the graph of the differential of f is transverse to the given support lambda. Okay, I'm welcome to have taken a point here, taken a small ball, and then taken a function that looks, say, like this. I'm welcome to do that. Calculating vanishing cycles for such a function is much more complicated than calculating vanishing cycles for when it's transverse. Okay. So the upshot is you should think that there's a kind of dictionary between the simplest functionals you can write down, these vanishing cycles, and small transverse Lagrangians. Okay, so let me now just formalize this into a, into a definition. So mm, definition, so objects, of exit to star x lambda are germs of Lagrangian graphs transverse to lambda. Okay. Anytime I have such a, a germ of a Lagrangian graph, I can calculate vanishing cycles, and there's a nice function. And the thing I want to emphasize is that these functionals are much easier to calculate in general due to this kind of transversality than usual stalks. Okay. So let's just as a final slide, let me do this in the case that we, we've been in the example we've been studying. And then let me leave it as an open question to you to try to figure out what are the morphisms between these objects. Okay. And you won't be entering, I mean, there's lots of history of research coming from geometry, homotopy theory, and so on, but um, there's no decisive kind of exit version. Okay, so I just don't have time to tell you more. Okay, so let me just uh, return to example, and then this will be the last, the last slide. Okay. So our example, of course, looks like our general cartoon. We have T star R. Okay, and then we have this, this lambda. And so I'm telling you that there are gonna be three basic measurements, roughly speaking three up to twists, that I care about. I can take vanishing cycles for a function like this, take vanishing cycles for a function like this, or vanishing cycles for a function like this. Okay, so the green always equal the graph of the differential of a function. Okay. At um, these points, I will recover, recover stock via vanishing cycles, maybe up to a twist. Okay. But the thing I want to emphasize, I'll put it in red, the thing I want to emphasize is at this point, this measurement, vanishing cycles, is a simpler measurement than just the stock at zero that you might have traditionally decided to assign. So what is this measurement? Okay, so if I go and I look at, uh, so, so here, here, phi f gives the following. Okay. If I think of my, um, my sheaf as having three stalks, so f0, f1, and f minus one, okay? We agreed that this was an isomorphism, okay? And phi f here gives the cone, let's call this map, uh, say, r minus, okay? So here, phi f gives the cone of r minus up to a twist. I'm not trying to get careful, be careful about the twists, okay? So the point is the three measurements that I'm suggesting you start with are not the three stalks or even the two stalks. I'm suggesting, so the objects are the, so, so conclusion or summary, 
So the, the objects give the three functionals. So one of them is the stock, or two of them are the stock at plus or minus one, okay? And the third one is the cone over R minus, okay? And I claim that those three measurements are much simpler than your original three measurements. I mean, I don't have time to explain, but one thing to say is these three measurements are trivalently related. So there's an auto equivalence of this category, as I explained before, that rotates these three measurements. So they're all on the same footing and the picture makes apparent they're all on the same footing as well. They're all small Lagrangians. Okay, so, um, so let me leave it there and just advertise to you again that um, I think it's a beautiful question to try to understand a kind of exit path description of the Homs between these vanishing cycles. So the challenge to you is give a topological exit description of the Homs between such okay there's lots and lots of research in this direction but it's also 1128 so i'm happy to <laughs> discuss with people in the tea room i ended up not talking at all about my own research in this direction which is fine <laughs> but in any case there's there's lots of interesting research i mean in, i'll just make a, a kind of comment i put down my pen but just make a comment that um you know, this question is equivalent to calculations of Fleur homology. It's equivalent to calculations of Lagrangian cobordisms. It's equivalent to many things, uh, Reeb dynamics. It's equivalent to many, many things that people with very different uh, viewpoints are thinking about. But I don't think anyone is thinking about it from a kind of exit point of view. And in my mind, that would be the kind of most structurally appealing point of view. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. I'll stop. Thank you so much, David, for that really generous talk. Awesome. I feel like it was well tailored to our community. Are there any questions out there? Yeah, I, I have a question. Can you comment on gradings? Yeah, great question. Okay, so I, all of this up to twists is, of course, my attempt to not comment on gradings. But let me make a comment about grading. So if you... Um, if you really want to um, um, okay, yeah, so there's different comments to make. So if you're working in the context of a cotangent bundle, then um, the um, kind of all background structures are already kind of canonically fixed for you. Like you didn't know it maybe, but there's already a kind of zero section there that's already kind of fixing your notion of uh, degree zero and so on. Um, but those background structures are not always the um, most invariant. So, um, so for example, in this, uh, in this cartoon I've been drawing, or in this specific example, um, if you set up the gratings correctly, you will find that you have three measurements, okay? And each of them has a degree one morphism to the next one. Okay, so when you think of a distinguished triangle, one way to invariantly say a distinguished triangle is not as a degree zero, degree zero, and then degree one. It's but to say, rather to say degree one, degree one, degree one, and then say, okay, and I'm working with Z mod two graded complexes. So what I advocate is that you first pass through, you think about Z mod two graded complexes, where you can really then say everything invariantly. In general, to grade everything, requires some additional background choices that may or may not make your life, like may, may, may or may not make things more apparent. Um, so one uh, situation, maybe I'll say one more common, one situation where there's a canonical kind of grading is if you work in a complex setting, complex manifold, uh, complex Lagrangian or complex stratification and so on, and you insist that all these Fs are holomorphic or are the real part of a holomorphic function. Then there's a, then all uh, gradings are kind of 
canonically provided to you. I mean, you shouldn't choose any, you should, there's no other choices than those. Okay, so I don't know, this is kind of a, I don't know, maybe you want to follow up, follow up question. I feel like I'm just uh, not helping, but. Uh, uh, no, you're, you're helping. Okay, good. <laughs> not harming anyway. <laughs> Could I ask a question? Yeah, please, um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, you were, first of all, um, could you get away with looking at uh, instead the Grassmannian, Lagrangian Grassmannian and open sub objects could be some open subset of that or that would be not enough transverse data? Oh yeah, no, yeah, right. So, um, um, yeah, so that's right. I think I think because because I'm asking you to make the Lagrangians these the small Lagrangians, I'm asking you to make them uh, transverse, specifying just a um, tangential data is sufficient. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so so and that's very closely related to John's question because the grading we're talking about is related to the universal cover of the uh, yeah. So so there's Lagrangian a, Grassmannian. Right, so there's, um, okay, yeah, there's a whole research subject about Maslow classes and so on that I, I'm just going to not say anything about, uh, but that's right. So there's, uh, you need to choose some background classes to be able to talk about kind of uh, how much you've twisted in this pi one of Lagrangian Grassmannian. Um, okay, an interesting one, one story. last, yeah. right, one last question then is, do you have in mind to restrict attention to symplectic manifolds, or eventually would you be interested in um, singular symplectic manifolds, ah, stratified okay. symplectic so, manifolds? Okay, so I'd only be interested in singular symplectic manifolds if somehow it made the techniques easier. Oh, okay. So but every, you, yeah. I mean, so somehow the, the world I, tr I traffic in, um, the symplectic manifolds are smooth, but the Lagrangians are very okay. singular. Okay. okay. Now, I have, there are lots of moments when you think, hmm, it might be interesting mm -hmm. to, I don't know, blow up the symplectic manifold and then suddenly it's a Poisson matter or something, you know, maybe right, right. if that technique could help, then mm -hmm. I endorse it. I, I would love yeah. to see it. Yeah. Um, you know, almost always, I mean, you know, there are beautiful singular symplectic manifolds, for example, nilpotent cones or other kind of things that admit symplectic resolutions. But almost always the fact that you, the most important thing is that you have a symplectic resolution somehow. So like, it's not that you're actually working on the singular symplectic thing, mm. you're actually working mm. on a smooth symplectic mm. thing, but maybe guided by some mm. you know, singular quotient of it. Um, yeah. Well, one thing I could mention there is that the Goldman Mills, uh, sorry, the Goldman um, symplectic structure on flat vector bundles on a surface Hmm. has this beautiful resolution, which is a symplectic derived stack. So potentially a better sounding like, it sounds like your, uh, in, you would envisage more moving towards a derived stack, which was a symplectic. Yeah, I mean, my, a, I mean, my philosophy somehow, I don't know, I guess this is a, an appropriate program to kind of espouse this kind of philosophy is like, you know, never try to make things more classical than they want to be. I don't know. <laughs> so like, if you're, you know, like when I write down T star G mod G, I'm very, very happy to think of that kind of derived symplectic. I, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, um, you know, what we're discussing here is topology. So it typically doesn't care about various derived structure, but I think in terms of the orienting yourself towards what structures you should be thinking about, I think, you know, you should be thinking about, you should, you should just allow whatever arises in life. Um, so, you know, for me, I, I should say that almost all of my thinking, yeah, so, so maybe I, I just say a word about what I would have told you is I, I, wa I wanted to tell you, just because it's kind of related to what Ezra is asking, I wanted to tell you about uh, a notion called arboreal singularities, which is a kind of uh, class of singularities of, of Lagrangians. And they roughly, I mean, conjecturally, they result from the following. You, you write down any Lagrangian, like we've been drawing here, and you allow it to deform in the class of Lagrangians. Okay, so you, it's kind of, you just allow it to wiggle, and then you ask, is there some stable class of singularities that are nicer than any others? So for example, if you do this with a graph, like you take a, a R2 and you draw a graph, like if I had drawn a five valent 
the vertex here and you wiggled it, you would have ended up with just trivalent vertices. And so there's a class of singularities that um, look, I mean, conjecturally are stable and one can calculate exit paths for it. I mean, I, I know the answer to quote exit paths in a kind of sense that I can calculate everything. I haven't tried to organize it or understand it in any kind of professional sense, but like it feels like you should be able to calculate everything in sight. Um, and then there's other research showing that everything can be kind of arborealized, can be wiggled. So there's kind of involved in various work. So I really feel like the time is ripe with that tool to, um, to kind of try to solve this kind of a problem. It's analogous, I know it from like uh, David and John and Nick Rosenblum's work, you know, you, you, you make a lot of hay by knowing that you can blow up singularities. Like I give you an arbitrary stratification, it's very difficult to understand, but if you can blow it up to kind of manifolds with corners, then you probably can prove some theorems. And so there's a now available technique that's like that in the Lagrangian situation. And so this is kind of an invitation to those who might be familiar with that to, to come, come in that direction. Um, unfortunately, I didn't say anything about that, but in any case, that's a um, uh, motivation for me of talking about this topic. Hey, David, this is David Ayala. I had a, a two-part question. So one is, um, if you could say what you meant by, quote, nice, uh, in reference uh, yeah. to the... To, mm -hmm. the, to the functor from constructible sheaves to k-modules. Right. And, so, and the second, and to contextualize, the second part of the question is, it, uh, if nice had some categorical characterization such as preserves colimus and as a tensor functor, it looks like a way of describing the k-points in the, in the lens of Tanakian duality. And so yeah. if you could comment on that one. Right, great. Okay, so, so, um, so, what I meant by nice is um, is maybe a bit subjective um, in that I meant, uh, I, I had roughly in mind, let me draw kind of a picture, I had roughly in mind uh, in decomposable in the sense that like if you, um, you know, if you have a stratified space and you give me say some subset of it, you know, look at constructible sheaves on it, you give me some subset and you look at the functor of like sections over that subset, you probably at some point will say, okay, that subset was a union of strata and I know sections over each of the strata, so I build it up from, from there. And so I had in mind uh, kind of indecomposable. Let me just draw one cartoon just to kind of convey this, or maybe not a cartoon, but like kind of real, uh, real but maybe easy uh, example of this. So let's just go back to our, our favorite example. So I was, I, I was arguing that these were the nicest. And you could have said, you know what, I actually, I really like, um, you know, um, well, okay, you could have said, I really like this, or I really like this. I don't know, something that may, may, maybe, let me, uh, sorry, let me make it cut through, or I really like this. I don't know, <laughs> you know, so, something more complicated than this kind of transverse condition. And in both of these, uh, the whole theory, I mean, it's a, it's a, non-trivial or interesting deep part of the theory that vanishing cycles have some invariance. And so in fact, I can deform both of these measurements. Let me draw them in I don't know, blue. Uh, I can deform this red one to say this measurement or maybe even to displace it. And I can deform this one into this measurement. And in both cases, what you will find is you will rewrite your prior measurement as a complex over these transverse measurements. So the first, so the, the, literally what I meant by nice, maybe it is, maybe one can decide that that's not necessary, was that anytime you give me any other measurement, if I just allow it to deform, I will be able to write it as a complex in terms of nice measurements. And so maybe I'll just restrict from the beginning to nice measurements. Great, so that's, that's helpful. That, I'll just put it out there that one way of characterizing good old exit is yeah. as the completely compact objects in constructible sheaves, meaning those objects hum out of which preserves all co-limits. Mm. And, and that, that strikes me similar to this. Uh, yeah, right. I think, come back to the I, I think there's a little difference here. So I think the, the nice that David Ial is asking for has to do with like being symmetric monoidal uh, in order to say that this Lagrangian exit path category is 
you know, endomorphisms of, uh, you know, of a, like a fiber functor, th that kind of a thing. Um, but this is the linear situation. So you need one extra ingredient, which is a T structure, because you only want to consider those types of fiber functors, which are connective with respect to a T structure, which seems to kind of come back to this issue of gratings. Whereas I, if I understood your answer, uh, David, this, this more seemed like it had to do with moving around like in the moduli space of Lagrangians, like to say that sort of the calculations you're making are in some sense constructible as you move through the, the moduli space of Lagrangians. Yeah, so, so um, okay, so I don't, I'll, uh, you guys understand what each other is saying probably better than I do. So, so um, yeah, so, so um, I mean, okay, I think I said what I meant by nice, which was kind of very naive, which was simply the sense in which some things are obviously built out of as complex as that of other things. Um, the, but, but John's comment also, and maybe this is getting back to David, your second comment about a kind of, okay, you use the word Tanakian, and in here for the moment, there is no uh, tensor. I mean, like, you know. That's uh, right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, I want it to be symplectic, the invariant, so I don't want to think about like mm -hmm. you know the fibers. But one thing that is um, kind of um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know um, uh, worth saying is that in many, many, many situations, um, these you know, and th this is kind of more an empirical comment, is that these nice functors, uh, you know correspond to like when you go to describe your category they it turns out like maybe you someone tells you your category should be mirror to some category of coherent sheaves like you're suggesting like maybe there's an algebraic variety so my category of sheaves is the same as coherent sheaves on this algebraic variety and almost always the the you know again this is empirical the measurements i'm calling nice correspond to um to nice coherent sheaves. So let me give you a kind of uh, beautiful example of this and the one that, that I'm most interested in. I mean, if you, you know, sort of ask me, why do I care about all this stuff? So, um, I mean, okay, outside of its intrinsic, <laughs> I don't know, you care about that thing, it's turtles all the way down. But in any case, one of the reasons I care about this is I'm very, very interested in uh, the Hitchin moduli. Uh, so I'm involved in trying to understand various things about, uh, geometric Langlands, in particular Betty geometric Langlands, which is the kind of topologist's version of geometric Langlands. And so let me draw a kind of cartoon, um, kind of cartoon of what one sees in that situation. So you have a, a Hitchin moduli, which is some, some cotangent bundle. So here's this kind of Hitchin, uh, so, so here this is an integrable system. Okay, so this is some moduli, some Hitchin moduli, and this is the base. Okay, so, so H, okay. And so this top thing is a symplectic manifold. We're happiest if it's the it's cotangent bundle of something. I don't know, cotangent bundle of something. Typically G bundles on a, vector bundles or G bundles on a curve. And um, what we're taught to study is that in this, this integrable system, this base has a special point zero. And the pre-image of zero is a complicated singular fiber in the, which I'll label with an N because in the case, changed to, in the case of the Hitchin moduli, this is what people call the global nil potent cone. Okay, so N is, N is uh, H inverse of zero. Okay, so it's a beautiful Lagrangian, conic Lagrangian. And um, okay, so I'm interested in, constructible sheaves on X, but they're not constructible with respect to any given stratification. All I know is that their singular support lie in this N. So I of course can choose some very, very refined stratification, but it'll involve like, I could triangulate the space, but then I'm introducing a huge amount of geometry that's not relevant to the problem. Uh, so now, just to go back to your question, you can ask what measurement do I care about most on this category of sheaves? And the answer is the following. Typically, there's a section of this moduli, something like Costin section or Costin Hitchin section, which looks like this. It, of course, passes through the zero fiber transversely in a point. 
I mean, just because it's a section. I mean, maybe it could have passed it through in some complicated thing, but you know, Austin and Hitchin uh, provide you nice mathematics and they provide you a section that passes through this N transversely. Okay, so let's call this kappa for this section. Okay. And taking vanishing cycles, thinking of kappa as some kind of graph in T star X, and taking vanishing cycles under Langlands corresponds to the structure sheaf of the Langlands dual space. So if you make this kappa intersect in a more complicated way, you pick something like this, it'll correspond to some coherent sheaf, but good luck to you trying to you know, figure out what it is. But if you choose these nice transverse coherent uh, measurements, you will discover that of course mathematics works. I don't say it's a science, it's some empirical fact, but it works out that those will correspond to really nice sheaves. I mean, really nice Tanakhian objects. So here there is something Tanakhian because here, this projection is not the projection to X, it is an integrable system. So there is a kind of, I don't know, you know, there is a kind of uh, Tanakhian picture here for which this section is uh, the unit section. Okay. okay, anyway, so I was just trying to convey to you that nice doesn't just have a kind of precise logical meaning, but it has a kind of empirical meaning as well. Great, thanks. That there is a Tanakhian place in which are there other questions out there? Yeah, uh, could I ask a question? Uh, question. This is uh, Jay Shaw. So you um, discussed uh, if you wanted to think about um, sort of constructible sheaves on delta one invariantly, we should be thinking about the triangle. Yeah. But, uh, you also discussed an interesting example of an exit uh, path category with non-trivial automorphisms, namely the cone on BS1, where I was stratifying uh, the complex plane by looking at the origin. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. um, in that example, uh, is there a way to, I mean, what should be the corresponding uh, way in which we want to think about that invariantly? Do you know about that? Yeah, so, so that, that's one of the first things I learned as a grad student. So the question was just to repeat is if you take C and you stratify it by zero in the complement, as I did in an example, then you can ask what is, uh, I mean, you can ask just what is exit paths, but you can ask is there something better? I mean, I don't know, better or more symmetric. And I learned this, I mean, this, I learned this from Deline that you should make your two measurements. You should first take a generic stalk. So let's have a point X1. Okay, so X0 is zero, but I'm not gonna make my other point, my other measurement, I'm not going to make it the stalk at zero. That will lead to the description I gave before of like R and M and H. There's a better thing to do, which is let me draw the cartoon of Here's T star of C. Okay, so sorry, I can't draw four dimensions. Um, and so far, what have my measurements been? I take a transverse Lagrangian here, and of course I should take a transverse Lagrangian up here. Okay? So what will that lead to back in the original picture? It'll lead to saying taking a small ball and taking vanishing cycles for a non-zero covector. Okay? So what I will, um, uh, assign to, uh, I'm about to answer your question. So here I just take, uh, you know, the stalk at X1 as one of my measurements. But here I take, uh, if I call, you know, this function, so F equals just say the function Z, Z is a coordinate, sorry, hard to read. Then the other measurement I should take is vanishing cycles for F at zero of F. Okay, so I should calculate just the change in my sheaf as I cross zero. And if you do this, you will discover um, that you get, uh, so this is, yeah, so this is associated, maybe I should say, this was associated to x1 and the zero covector, and this is associated to x0 and a non-zero covector. Let's call it dz. Uh, okay, so what you will discover is that yours, there's a map, if you get the gratings right, a map in degree zero in both directions. Okay, so people, I think once upon a time called them P and Q. They, you know, there is a position and a momentum, so maybe that's where P and Q come. And then there's a relation, which is that um, you, it turns out that um, one minus PQ is the monodromy. So one minus, so I do PQ is the mon monodromy acting on this. So this should be invertible. And that also implies that one minus QP is invertible. 
Anyway, so this is the, I think, Jay, I don't know, I hope I interpret your question. So this is, I think, the, a better quote exit, so this is kind of exit <laughs> in this situation. And I would argue, I would be happy to argue even with the loyalists that this is better than traditional exit. This is invariant under, there's a natural symmetry, which is to flip the two nodes. That's kind of the Fourier transform. Uh, this makes it clear perverse sheaves are, these P and Q are in degree zero and perverse sheaves are in degree zero for these maps. Um, I mean, the measurements are in degree zero. So in any case, this is another uh, example, uh, it was in my notes somewhere, of where we know what the answer of quote exit is. Um, and it has to do with this path P is some kind of traveling, it's traveling between these two measurements, but it's not, it has nothing, you know, the stopping and taking the stock at zero itself is kind of not part of the story. You can of course extract it. It's something like the cone over P, but it's not part of the initial structure. Yeah, that, that was what I was asking. Thanks a lot. Yeah, and I think that picture is due to, I think maybe to, I learned it from, I think, I don't know. What do they say? Uh, uh, it's all due to Grotendieck at some point. <laughs> um, one follow-up question, David. This is Chris again. Oh, yeah. When when you said you understand exit in the arboreal case, did you mean you also that you have a complete answer to your challenge in that case? That you understand no, the whole I, category, or did you mean you understand the objects? No, I guess what I mean, and it's it's kind of this is really why I feel it's an invitation to this crowd. I I can make any kind of finite calculation, but I don't know the correct invariant way to organize everything. Got it. So the point is, in that case, I maybe maybe I'll let me make a kind of, uh, kind of informal statement. In that case, roughly speaking, what's nice about arboreal is that these vanishing cycles either have a contractible space of communication or no, or empty communication. So somehow you kind of blow up the Lagrangian enough so that two measurements kind of either talk to each other uh, local, like kind of by a contractible thing or don't. But now you have to kind of descend that back to your original Lagrangian. And you want to ulti ultimately, you see the problem, maybe here's the, here's the problem why I'm not satisfied with my understanding, is that blow up procedure breaks a lot of symmetry. You, you, you blow things up and you kind of introduce all sorts of new geometry. And so you really want to read, you know, descend whatever I can understand in that blow up. You want to descend it back to the original Lagrangian and give a kind of just direct invariant description. Uh, I'm not saying it's the same depth of geometry, but you can think of it, uh, you know, uh, in terms of like, you know, um, maybe I'm thinking of Deline right now. So, you know, Deline's original mixed Hodge theory for a singular variety what he did is he said, okay, let's blow up the variety till it's smooth. Then we have Hodge theory, and then we'll prove that it was invariant under all these blow ups and so on. Okay. Now, and so you get into this whole story of logarithmic differential forms and so on, but what you, what, you know, is not available to you, and I don't know, maybe it is now, but I, I don't know, is like kind of an invariant notion of the like mixed Hodge structure that didn't involve breaking symmetry and blowing up. You, know, you just want to say like, here's my singular variety. Okay, it's mixed Hodge theory is this. Like it's, you know, so I want to just you to hand me, like even in this case, let me just say, even in the case Jay asked about, uh, you know, that's not an arboreal configuration. It's very complicated. I would blow it up, calculate, and then have to descend to recover Deline's description. So I don't know how to do that descent at all in general. So here in this in this analogy, the blow up is the resolution into transverse objects. Yeah. So let me let me just draw a picture of what the blow up would be in the, in this situation. So the kind of uh, and I know I didn't explain this at all, but just to give you a convey what would happen. So the arboreal blow up of this situation would look. I can't draw a four dimension, so it's kind of misleading to draw real pictures. But it the Lagrangian would look like the following. So it's a cylinder with a membrane in the middle, okay? And what's nicer about this picture than the original two complex lines crossing is that the only singularities of this Lagrangian are trivalent singularities. If you think there's a circle's worth, I don't know if you can see the picture, there's a circle's worth of trivalent singularities there. So this blow up has somehow nicer singularities. If you know what the triangle is of objects in a stable category, then you can calculate everything based on this blow up. 
But of course, it's far less pretty than the original two complex lines crossing. So you can see why I've kind of done something to make calculation easier. So like, in fact, I, you know, I can prove Deline's description directly. I, I have enough experience. But I think the easiest way to prove Deline's description is, in fact, go to this blow up. You know what a triangle is. And then you have the description. <laughs> you know, it's, it's literally just a, you take a, you know, an integral of local, I mean, it, it's a co-sheaf on this, uh, you take kind of sections of a co-sheaf on this picture. And all you need to know is that along here, it's a triangle and along here, you know, along all here, it's smooth. So it's a very easy way to calculate, but of course, then you have to kind of, what was this in terms of the original picture? So yeah, that, that's my satisfaction, yeah. Um, hey, David, I was wondering, since uh, I believe this is being recorded, if you could just jot down some references for us. Ah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I kind of skipped all references. Um, uh, no, I, 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 I'm actually not, not so much as far as what you're pulling from as, as much as what we could look into if we want to investigate this further. Okay, so let me, yeah, so, so let me just sort of say some standard references for some things that, that I, I mentioned. So, of course, I think the place to start, although it's difficult uh, as a learning place, but maybe as a reference, it's fantastic, is Kashiwara Shapira's sheaves on manifolds. Um, manifolds. So this will tell you, I mean, it's a remarkable, remarkable book, uh, especially now that it's, I don't know, maybe 30 years old or so, um, 25 years old. Um, it's, um, it will tell you all about manifolds, sheaves on them, singular support, Lagrangian support. It will tell you everything that goes into sort of everything that you need in order to talk about sheaves, uh, you know, X lambda. Okay, so you know, I ch the challenge I put forth is to um, to uh, you know give an exit description of this. But this is the kind of start. This is the thing that you kind of start with as your understanding. Um, so this is one kind of uh, standard standard reference. Um, um, What else? So, okay, so it also will tell you about vanishing cycles. Vanish, I just did. So I'm, I'm hesitating here because there's a huge amount of literature on a variety of things relate, I mean, lots and lots of different things related to this. But I think to answer your question, I think this gets you to like 98% of what you need to think about this problem. So let me just leave it there rather than trying to be particular about other things. Great. Okay. Um, are there any other, I know we've had a lot of questions, but um, if there's any urgent ones, now is the time. Okay, uh, if you're up for it, David, even if it's brief, uh, to join us in the tea room, I put a link for that in the chat uh, so you all can see it. Um, so, David, thanks so much for, for sharing all this stuff and inviting us to engage in this way. Thanks.